Chris, do you think Intel will succeed in building a foundry business that can compete with the TSMC uh, and make U.S. self-sufficient in advanced chips uh, manufacturing? And how are some of the advantages and disadvantages you've seen in Intel's effort to set up its own foundry business? In, in terms of Intel, you know, I think one of the conclusions from the comments we've just heard is uh, the, the challenges in setting up a, a foundry business model. And we've seen a number of companies uh, try to do so and compete with TSMC um, with, with varying degrees of success, but, um, but certainly TSMC has vast scale uh, and advanced technologies that make it uh, difficult to, to compete with. So I, we're certainly going to see Intel um, uh, try to build out their foundry business over the next several years. I'm a historian rather than a, a uh, someone who can see into the future, so I'll, I will refrain from confident predictions about uh, what will what will come next. I'll leave that to, to smarter people in the audience. Um, but it, it, it certainly does seem like um, like building a foundry business from scratch is is not something that's easy when there are already um, multiple successful foundry businesses. I think as, as far as Intel being a foundry is concerned. Uh, I think uh, Jensen Huang of um, NVIDIA uh, said the best. He said, Jensen said that uh, TSMC has learned to dance with 400 partners. We have about 400 customers. TSMC has learned to dance with 400 partners. Intel has always danced alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it weren't for the implication that we were a taxi dancer, I, <laughs> I would approve uh, Jensen's uh, uh, comments even more, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's important. Globalized supply chain networking, the best of the best, sort of produce what, what we're having today here. Therefore, our next round of subject will be, is globalization dead? I, Morris, actually, uh, you warned the world in your Phoenix speech last year, globalization, I quote, globalization and free trade are almost dead and are likely to come back. What's your, do you, do you care to elaborate on that? And what's your observation? And um, how would that impact? You know, I think there's no question in my mind that at least in the chips sector, mm. uh, globalization is dead. Free trade is dead. Uh, you know, just just uh, look at um, the way uh, uh, China uh, has been uh, 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 embargoed. And uh, uh, I mean, the entity lists and so on, you know. So, and I agree with that. I, I mean, I, I support that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now, uh, but on the other hand, there is uh, this uh, onshoring and in the name of security and uh, and uh, resilience. Uh, uh. Yeah, I mean, so there's. There's no question in my mind that in the chip sector, globalization is dead. Free trade is not quite that dead, okay? <laughs> but, but it's in danger, it's in danger. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, and do, do you think that will help the development of chip industry in the, of course in the future? Not. Of course not. I, would talk, I have already talked about that. Uh, the first thing that, happen, that will happen is that um, the cost will go up. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and when the cost goes up, uh, the uh, pervasiveness of chips will either stop or slow down considerably. Mm. Mm. So we're in a different game. We are going to be in a different game, you know. I mean, the reason that Chris started to write the book 
was because he realized that chips were so pervasive. We needed chips everywhere. That was the reason he started writing. But now he has finished writing the book, and the game has changed. <laughs> With the help of the book. I mean. <laughs>